Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. Thank you so much to mine and everybody at the American Inter Intercultural Center. See, I'm already, uh, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm tripping over myself. Um, uh, thanks to mine and everybody at the American Intercultural Center for uh, inviting me to be part of this, especially in association uh, with the work of the great Dr. Jonathan Gales, uh, his uh, film White Scripts, Black Superman. How many of you got, got a chance to see that? Okay, fantastic documentary. And I'm, uh, not to, I'm uh, very, I feel very fortunate because I've actually had the chance to talk to Dr. Gales several times. Uh, and so when I, I called him up and uh, I'm like, so I'm, they've got me doing this lecture in association with your movie. I'm like, do you want me to do anything or say anything? He's like, you got the PhD, you can figure it out. So, you know, um, that's a lot of pressure. Um, but, it's, it's, but I really kind of enjoy it because I don't know about you, but the idea of spending my Wednesday night talking about superheroes for about 45 minutes, that may not be your idea of a perfect Wednesday night, but it's, it's pretty much mine. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's basically my life. That's what I do. Um, and I, I, I kind of want to start off tonight by telling a story. Uh, a personal story. Um, my girlfriend, uh, her name is Pang, and she is Hmong. Uh, we uh, knew, we uh, met in middle school, in uh, high school. We, we went to the same high school. But we really didn't start dating until college. And one of the things we would, uh, we would do together early on is we would uh, uh, get together on Saturday nights and watch Justice League, um, which is a fantastic television program. Um, and I knew right there she was a keeper. Um, but as time went on, I met her nieces, who became my nieces, and her nieces are biracial. And, you know, as being the cool aunt and uncle, I'm not just saying that, they have said as much, okay? That's not just me tooting my own horn. I have it on good authority from those children that we are the cool aunt and uncle. Um, they began to like a lot of the things we liked. So we would take them to the comic book store, we'd watch the cartoons with them, take them to the movies. Um, and, you know, they, you know, they loved Wonder Woman and Supergirl and all these characters, Storm and all that. Um, but as, I was, as they were enjoying them, I'm like, well, there's not a lot of characters who look like them. There's not a lot of characters who have that background, who have that experience of being uh, biracial, uh, who have had that experience of having, you know, grandparents who can speak a different language, that sort of thing. Um, and that's kind of what got me interested in studying this stuff, because uh, as time went on, I got another niece and a, and a nephew and another niece on uh, the biological on my side, and uh, you know I, I started wondering what kind of media are we creating, what kind of media are we representing uh, for them. So that kind of pushed me down this path. I went to the University of Oklahoma. I worked with uh, the great Dr. Maida Kristarfin, who will probably be watching this at some point, and I hope I'm not going to embarrass her. Um, uh, but we started working on projects like this together. Uh, and it kind of ultimately culminated me coming here to the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, where I feel very fortunate to be able to do stuff like this. So uh, that's kind of my little opening spiel about how I got associated with this, how I got involved with it. But in a lot of ways, it's kind of justifying a youth, uh, a youth well wasted. Let's say that. Okay. Uh, so my my discussion tonight is about superheroes. Okay. Uh, how many of you in here would say that you are a fan of superheroes or have enjoyed a superhero comic or a movie or a cartoon or something like that? Okay, yeah. Um, and you wouldn't be alone. The superhero business is a very big business. Comics alone, and when we talk about comics, there are comics that are not superhero comics, but the majority of the market, a pretty strong majority, is made up of things like Iron Man and Spider-Man and Batman and so on and so forth. Uh, and we've, we're, talk, we're talking about $518 million alone in just comics in what we call the direct market. That's the comic book shops that sell comics. So they buy directly from these retailers or these uh, distributors, they put them in the stores. That's uh, what we call the direct market. But if we also look at bookstores, grocery stores, on the internet, digital distribution, we're talking substantially more than that, especially as we start factoring in digital distribution. But where superheroes have really taken off is the movies. The Avengers, I believe the number two highest grossing movie of all time, or number three, somewhere in there. Uh, $1.52 billion worldwide, that's billion with a B. One of the biggest movies of all time. Basically everybody has seen this movie. How many of you have seen The Avengers? That's what I, that's what I thought, okay? Iron Man 3, $1.2 billion worldwide. So we know who's really the boss in that outfit. Uh, but I was looking on the website boxofficemojo.com for the top five opening weekends for the United States are superhero movies. I think the only one that's not is Harry Potter. So we really love our superheroes and our wizards in America. Okay? So 
there's a, there's a lot of important stuff to talk about, but why academically are we so interested in superheroes, or why academically am I so interested in superheroes? Well, the first thing is that I would argue, and I'm not the only one who would argue this, is that superheroes are what we call a contemporary mythology, okay? We have Hercules, we have Gilgamesh, okay? And we have Iron Man, okay? We have all these characters, and we've had these characters that we used to tell morality stories about you know, good and evil throughout history. Okay? And superheroes are arguably the latest in that trend. It's just that you know, we're profiting from them now. We're making money. It's an industry. Moreover, superheroes have what we call a very sort of, inter uh, sort of multi-generational and multicultural appeal. Okay? Everybody, young, old, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whoever you are, wherever you're from, you have an idea of the concept of a superhero. And you probably like them at one point, okay? Or maybe you still do. Some of us never really get over it. Uh, that, and that's very, very important because, you know, the, the mom who grew up watching Wonder Woman on TV with Linda Carter doing the little spin and all that sort of thing could now uh, take uh, her daughter to go see the Wonder Woman movie if they ever actually made one, and then, they could act and then she could uh, share that experience with her mother. There's that sort of transgenerational appeal to it. And they're very rhetorically potent. Now, I'm going to use a term called rhetoric. How many of you are familiar with the term rhetoric? Okay, if you're in my classes, you probably should be. Um, when we talk about rhetoric, we're talking about the ways that communication is used. And I'm going to talk about superheroes specifically as a form of communication, talking about social issues that we really deal with every day. And they're very, very potent in that regard because these superheroes are the best of us. They're the best, they're the brightest, you know, they're, you know, they dress in primary colors because that's supposed to be sort of the thing that represents good and simplicity, okay? And they fight evil, they vanquish the foes we can't, okay? It's a very rhetorically potent metaphor. And it's been used in a lot of ways to talk about social issues, okay? Uh, and we'll talk about some of the ways that comics have done that in the past, but superheroes have long been used as an allegory for real-world concerns. The X-Men, for example, have been used uh, ev uh, for everything from uh, the civil rights movement, to the LGBT movement, to basically any sort of group that feels that they are outcast or ostracized from society, they have latched onto the X-Men as sort of a representative team. And that's a very, very powerful message. It's a very, very powerful thing that these characters do. Finally, they're also kind of one of the perfect examples of a crossroads of cultural and economic uh, mandates. So we have these sort of cultural things, these baggages we attach to characters like Daredevil or Mr. Fantastic or Thor, but they also have to serve corporate masters. So you'll see how this becomes an issue later on because ultimately, if a character is not profitable, it is hard to make a movie about them or hard to make a comic about them or hard to do much of anything. And so, one of the cultural mandates that we run into when we talk about superheroes and we talk about a lot of things in media is the notion of white privilege. Now, I want to talk about white privilege for a second because it's kind of a challenging concept. White privilege essentially is the notion that uh, being white, especially in America, conveys certain privileges upon you that you might not have if you are of a different ethnicity or skin color. And it ultimately comes down to skin color. Um, and I want to clarify, uh, being white is not necessarily a bad thing, okay? Uh, so so uh, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, before we get defensive and that sort of thing, it's, there's nothing inherently wrong with being white, but you have to recognize that there are certain advantages that it affords. I don't have to worry about people looking at me twice when I go into a convenience store, because they will assume I'm not there to rob the place, okay? I don't have to worry about people crossing the street to get away from me, okay? It's not something that's going to get you uh, to the front of the line at Disney World, but it's something that is nonetheless a powerful set of privileges that we don't necessarily recognize because we don't necessarily see the other side. And because our race is not put in our face every day, because we are not constantly reminded of who we are and who we are not, we don't really necessarily see these issues as, as significant. That is white privilege. Author, uh, you know, sort of the classic example uh, is, the, is the invisible knapsack. Has anybody heard of that term? Okay? The Invisible Knapsack is this classic essay by Macintosh, and Macintosh talks about, you can kind of think about it as this knapsack, this backpack you carry around, and then you just sort of pull things out of it occasionally as you need them, but you don't necessarily realize you do it because it's invisible. Okay? 
So this concept really becomes something that's not really questioned a lot, it's not interrogated, and so oftentimes it's just taken for granted. And a lot of the times when we see these things taken for granted, they happen in media, okay? So, how does that reflect with superheroes? Well, there's some main themes that I want to talk about tonight, okay? The first is this notion of, the, of whiteness as the default, okay? It's a binary. You are, you know, for those of you who know binary, there's zero and then there's one. And one is the switch that makes things different. So whiteness is the zero and then anything else is a one. It's different, okay? It's no longer the same thing. So whiteness is considered to be the default in superhero stories. Those characters who are not white are often defined by stereotypes or by their own ethnicity, okay? They're not, and that's usually the defining characteristic assigned to them. Another uh, notion that we've seen, especially recently, is this notion of whiteness as this classic desirable thing, that the characters who are white are somehow the true version, and if you try to replace them with a character of a different skin color, they are a pretender to the throne. They are no longer that same character, and I'll show you some examples of that as we go. And there's two main sources this comes from. The first is the content creators. And when I talk about content creators, I'm not just talking about the artists, the writers, the filmmakers. I'm also talking about the studios, the publishers, the people who make money, okay? The people who are sitting there saying, yes, let's go ahead and make another 400 Avengers movies. That would be great. Uh, the fans are the other source because the fans theoretically are the ones who have a lot of control in determining what gets published, what gets made, and what doesn't. So those are the two main sources of these kind of uh, channels of rhetoric that we're going to talk about tonight. And I'll show you some examples of both. So let's start off with the concept of whiteness as a default, okay? In a lot of comics, especially in kind of the, the, the original superhero, Superman, okay? We see whiteness as this default or natural state, okay? And Superman's really the best way to explain this. We have a character the last son of Krypton, the last son of an alien world, comes from millions of light years away in a rocket ship to the United States. Now, there's, there's all kinds of theories about what aliens would look like and all that sort of thing based on science, but we can probably assume that there's a very small chance they would look like Superman, correct? Because uh, it's very unlikely that an, an alien race would happen to look exactly like a white Midwestern or exactly have, a, have the white skin color and, the, and that sort of thing. Um, and he, so he has these very sort of Anglo features and he becomes essentially a paragon of all that is good, all that is right. And so subconsciously we're associating this sort of like kind of uh, middle of the road, Kansas sort of uh, you know, white uh, uh, identity with you know, basically being you know, God, being the force for good on earth because Superman is essentially a God among us. So, this is kind of where it starts, and Superman really kind of creates the blueprint for many, many stories to come. Anybody who's created a superhero and says they don't owe anything to Superman is a liar. I mean, that's just simply what it is. So you can kind of see why this becomes a recurring theme. And also, the other thing I have to talk about, um, because you, some of you will be thinking, well, weren't these characters created 75 years ago? Yes, actually, Superman was created almost 80 years ago now. Um, and at the time, it was, it was very, very uncommon. And for those of you who saw the film, you know that a lot of the early representations of non-white characters were very stereotypical, very uh, offensive, uh, and very much kind of tailored through what uh, the white uh, perspective saw these people of different races as. So yes, it was very much common to have predominantly white characters because that was predominantly who was making the comics. That was predominantly who was buying them. Okay, But they weren't the only people buying them. And it, especially lately, that becomes a major issue because the people who grew up with these characters, these characters, you know, I, like Hal Jordan, like Superman, that sort of thing, and have seen them kind of eliminated or kind of replaced with uh, different characters over the years, have wanted to bring them back. Now, for those of you who are comic book fans in here, I'm going to blame pretty much all of this on Jeff Johns because he deserves it. I really don't like Jeff Johns' work for the most part. Um, but one of the things that Jeff Johns did is we had all these different takes on the Green Lantern character. Now, those of you who are not familiar with the Green Lantern Corps, essentially it's a crew of intergalactic policemen who have magic rings and they can think whatever they want and it happens. And they create these hard light contracts. Okay, look, I, like I said, I have, a, I have a PhD. 
I, I'm trying not to get too nerdy here, but it's going to happen. So I just want to prepare you guys in advance. Um, and so one of the predominant Green Lanterns we had seen uh, up until about uh, you know, the 80s, 90s was Jon Stewart. And those of you who uh, saw the film know how important of a character he is. He's one of my favorite Green Lanterns, mostly because he's not boring. Hal Jordan, the 1960s what they call Silver Age Green Lantern, is super boring. He is a white guy. He's a test pilot. He's not that interesting. The only time he became interesting is when he turned to some sort of demigod and destroyed an entire city. Um, and then they kind of tried to wipe all that away because the, character, because the creator, Jeff Johns, wanted to bring back Hal Jordan because that was his Green Lantern. That was the Green Lantern he grew up with. That's the character he wanted to write about. So we start to see this kind of trend, and it starts there. And I'm not saying that Jeff Johns did this because he's like, we can't have a black Green Lantern or we can't have anybody who's not this guy. But it's, what, it's one of the things that kind of leads to the system of white privilege. These are the characters I grew up with. These are the characters I want to see. So let's kind of erase the progress we've made and bring them back. It's a, it's a, it's a principle of regression. So that kind of starts off. And then in summer 2010, uh, Gail Simone, fantastic comics writer, introduces this character, Ryan Choi. Uh, who is Asian, uh, he's the all-new Adam. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Adam, his entire power is that he can get very, very small. And he rides ants and stuff like that. Not to be confused with Ant-Man, totally different guy. And so people really like this. He, he's a likable character, he's handsome, he's funny, he gets the girls, which are things that traditionally Asian characters are not allowed to do. And so he's a really, really beloved character. But the sales aren't so great on his comic. And they decide that for one of their big comic events, they need to make one of their villains look really, really cool and tough and, and scary. Uh, the villain in question is Deathstroke. If you're asking me, what do you think of Deathstroke, Brian? I'm like, I don't like Deathstroke very much at all. There's not much you can do to make him interesting. But they thought the way that they could make him interesting is by having him brutally murder Ryan Choi. So in a big graphic splash page, you have Deathstroke jamming a sword through Ryan Choi's chest He's dead, and in the ultimate insult to this groundbreaking character, he is mailed to the guy who hired Deathstroke to kill him in a matchbox. It's really, really bad. But that's where things get started, and that's kind of what triggered my interest in it, is actually that storyline. We'll I'll show you some of the research that came out of that. Uh, summer 2011, Warner Brothers, seeing Marvel Comics kind of trying to eat their lunch in the, at, the, at the theater, decides they want to make a Justice League movie, and they turn to the guy who, uh, George Miller, who made Mad Max and also made Happy Feet, um, which is one of the greatest swings in terms of what kind of movies you're making, possibly of all time. Uh, they turn to him and say, we want to make a motion-captured, computer-animated Justice League movie, and we want to get Common to be Jon Stewart. Now, Common is an actor and rapper, fantastic at both. Um, and I thought, great, I really like Jon Stewart, I like Common, let's see where this goes. The movie gets derailed, and part of it is because DC Comics, the editorial, which at the time was being uh, increasingly influenced by Jeff Johns, uh, wanted to make Hal Jordan the character. So instead of getting this Justice League movie with uh, uh, Jon Stewart, we get 2011's Green Lantern. If you haven't seen this movie with Ryan Reynolds as Hal Jordan, I don't want to say it's the worst superhero movie of all time, because there are worse ones, but it's pretty bad. So, but because they were so convinced that this was the character they wanted to build the universe around, we lost that potential uh, casting opportunity right there. 2012, the Thor movie comes out. They cast Idris Elba as Heimdall, the god who can see to the nine worlds. Okay? Now, if you've ever watched anything Idris Elba's in, you know he's amazing. He's a fantastic actor. And he killed it. He's fantastic in that movie. Fan as fantastic as anybody wearing a gigantic gold horned helmet and carrying a ridiculously large sword can be. But we have backlash, because Heimdall, in Norse mythology, is claimed to be one of the whitest of all the gods. Now, if you know your Marvel mythology, you'll know that the gods in Thor are not necessarily the actual uh, Norse gods. But that's getting completely aside the point. Now, this is largely a fringe group. These were white supremacist groups who were complaining, but they were still getting enough traction in the media to make it uh, kind of an issue. And it became an issue, uh, uh, even though, again, Idris Elba was fantastic in that movie. So what we see again and again and again is the rhetorical implication on the part of comics creators and the part of filmmakers that minority uh, characters and actors can't or shouldn't fill white roles because, for whatever reason, white characters are deemed to be more marketable. They're more desirable. Okay? And 
historically, I, and again, because remember that the people who get into these uh, positions are always looking at what's worked in the past because that's where they live. Um, they see that, you know, well, we'd, we've had trouble selling a, a movie that has a minority hero or a woman in the lead role, okay? One of the reasons, you know the reason there is no Wonder Woman movie right now, okay? This is, this is a sidebar. There is no Wonder Woman movie right now because of the movie Catwoman with Halle Berry. Warner Brothers saw that, saw the bad reviews, saw the bad box office, and they're like, well, America just doesn't want a female superhero. The answer, of course, is that no, America has no problem with female superheroes, as evidenced by Underworld, as evidenced by Resident Evil, as evidenced by tons of other movies. They just didn't want that movie because it was terrible. But that's not what executives see. So we have this sort of notion that if we don't have a white male in the lead, it's not going to sell. And unfortunately, sometimes that ends up being the case. So that's a problem. That's an issue that needs to be resolved. But, it's also, but that kind of influences the kind of characters we see in the actors who are playing them. Um, another example of this, I mean, you'll notice that and it's always a white male in the lead. Every time you see a superhero movie poster, here's Iron Man, and then here's Scarlet Widow, or here's uh, Scarlet, or no, Black Widow. Scarlet Witch is in the next one. Sorry, sorry, everyone. Here's Black Widow in the back, and she's, you know, obfuscated by everything. Um, we never see... And so, like, you know, Will Smith, if he wanted to do an actual superhero movie instead of whatever Hancock was, would probably make a billion dollars. But for some reason, they just don't want to do it. Anyway, a lot of stuff going on. Like I said, I could talk about this stuff for hours. But we also see increasingly that uh, a lot of characters, and I shouldn't say so much anymore. We'll talk about why that is. Um, but in the past, we saw characters really defined by their race and their stereotypes. And Mark Singer writes this great uh, essay or this great journal article talking about how superhero comics, even though they try to bring in minority characters and try to make more diverse uh, situations, they're still really just paying lip service to diversity. Um, they're not really trying to explore what it means to be black, what it means to be Asian, what it means to be Hispanic. They're simply just putting these characters in for the sake of trying to basically make people like me happy. Um, and it's really not the right reason to do it. You want to try to explore these things. And with the idea of a secret identity, the idea of trying to have different identities for different situations, there's a lot of rhetorically rich things to mine there. And a good writer could do a lot with that. So that's why it's so troubling and so baffling, honestly, we haven't really seen that happen. Um, and what's really interesting, and they talk about this in uh, Dr. Gale's movie, is that when you are a white superhero, you can be anything. You can be a Superman, you can be an Iron Man, you can be a Batman, you can be the Flash, you can be Green Lantern. You're not defined by your race. But when you are a black superhero, well, you are Black Lightning. You are Black Goliath. What's this guy's power? Well, he controls electricity. Great, we'll call him Black Lightning. And the creator of Black Lightning, as you know, is in that film, and he talks about it. And I think he has a good rationale for why he named the character that way, but it's still kind of weird, especially when you look in the context of, this, of the sort of uh, things that we've seen with other characters. Here's Black Goliath. His power, he gets really, really big. Great. He's Black Goliath. So we see a lot of that, but we also see characters who are defined by sort of stereotypes. And Luke Cage is one they spend a lot of time on in the film, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time on because I think they do a great job talking about him, but I want to address a couple things. First off, you have Luke Cage comes out of the 70s, very heavily influenced by black exploitation, very heavily influenced by what sort of the stereotypical image of a black man was back then. And so we have this storyline where... Luke Cage picks up the hammer of Thor. Now, those of you who are comic book geeks know this is a big deal. Very few people have successfully picked up the hammer of Thor, and there's very good reasons for that, which I don't have time to get into. So when a character picks up the hammer of Thor, it's a really big deal, and it's really important. It says something about that character, that they are worthy to hold it. So Luke Cage is worthy to hold the hammer of Thor. Great. Awesome. Except he starts saying stuff like, by the gleaming gates of funky Asgard, you suckers are going to eat hammer. Now, there's a part of me that actually likes this panel very, very much because it's kind of hilarious. But there's also some, the other part of me is like, this is very problematic, and it kind of shows what they were working with and what they viewed Luke Cage as. He was a stereotype. Okay? Now, in the modern era, Luke Cage is kind of, they've dropped the, the, the jive talking, they've dropped his silk yellow shirt that always manages to get torn off, but now they just basically make him run around in other shirts that manage to get torn off. Um, he's still very kind of stereotypically, you see him carrying chains and using chains as a weapon a lot. Um, 
It's problematic, and Brian Michael Bendis is a writer who's done a lot to try to kind of rehabilitate, rehabilitate the character and make him kind of more relatable. He's actually uh, one of the few interracial marriages in comics. He's married to a white woman, um, and you know they have a kid together, and it's actually very cute. Um, but he still kind of embodies some different stereotypes, even though they've kind of sanded off some of the edges. Uh, Asian superheroes don't fare much better. How many of you remember Jubilee? Maybe you watched the old X-Men cartoon or something like that. Now, Jubilee is a young Chinese-American teenager. She's a member of the X-Men. She's a mutant. What's her power? Fireworks. She creates fireworks because Chinese people create fireworks. <laughs> now, not only is this a pretty useless power, it's also kind of stereotypical, right? So Jubilee, even though she's a beloved character, is one of the ones that kind of gets singled out by saying this, her entire reason for being is based on a stereotype associated with her ethnicity. The Mandarin. Um, now, the Mandarin, I want to talk about for a second, the Mandarin is Iron Man's best and probably only villain. Um, and that says a lot, because Iron Man probably is one of the, for one of the best superheroes ever, has one of the worst villains galleries ever. And the Mandarin is part of the reason why. The Mandarin is introduced as this sort of Chinese warlord, okay? And, he, and they show him in kind of like, you know, the very stereotypical, like, eyebrows out to here, the Fu Manchu mustache, and he's got, like, long fingernails and all. Like, basically every image of the yellow peril stereotype from, like, the uh, 1940s to about the 1970s is the Mandarin. And they kind of sand him down a little bit over the years, too. But it's funny, in his first introduction, he's introduced as a master of karate. Now, karate is a Japanese martial art, okay? The Mandarin is Chinese. So effectively, what they have done is contribute to this notion that is all too prevalent in the media, that, me that Asians are some sort of monolithic group, and they're all the same, when in reality, there are tons of different ethnicities and backgrounds and experiences that make up the, that make up, uh, the Asian population, but not to the Mandarin. The Mandarin is basically everything, every Asian stereotype in one. Now, I want to talk about that. I'm going to come back to him in a little bit, because Iron Man 3, the movie, actually did something really brilliant with his character, um, which I'm going to ruin that for you if you haven't seen it, so I apologize. Um, Karate Kid from the Legion of Superheroes, the only, basically the only non, uh, person of color on that team except for Tyrock, and Tyrock had a whole other problem, a list of problems that you saw in the film. Um, karate Kid, he's Asian. He knows karate. Move on. Like, literally, that is the entire, uh, that is the entire explanation for that character. Uh, Psylocke, okay, Psylocke is, um, it's going to take me a second to explain Psylocke. Psylocke is a mutant who's part of the X-Men. She is a ninja who can use psychic abilities to create swords and daggers and stuff like that. Now, that's on its own kind of, you know, whatever. We're, at this point, we're used to it. Um, what's interesting about Psylocke is technically she is a white British woman inside the body of a Japanese woman. And, to get, and for me to explain that would require me to go back and explain 1990s um, X-Men comics, which is basically impossible. I have a PhD, and I cannot explain what was happening in the 1990s. Yes, the 1990s were a weird time for everybody, but they were especially weird at Marvel Comics. But, uh, so the fact that she is a white woman inside the body of an Asian woman brings up entirely different questions about what, you know, about, not only about what her character is meant to represent, but also, you know, d are they trying to say that all Asian women want to be white women uh, underneath? It's a question that needs to be explored, and that's why Psylocke is a very problematic character, even though she's one of the most prominent Asian female superheroes. Um, now, with this slide, I want to talk about the experiences faced by Native American and Hispanic uh, characters, but the problem is there weren't that many, um, and there aren't that many that are, ki uh, that are really that prominent. So I want to talk about a few, uh, and of course, that's a completely different issue. I want to talk about a few. The first is Apache Chief from the Super Friends, um, who says his magic word, Inuk Chuck, and he gets really, really big, which is perfectly fine, but that's basically all he is. He, he, he speaks stereotypically, he dresses stereotypically, and he gets really big. Danny Moonstar, another one of the X-Men, she is Native American. Uh, she uses a flaming bow and arrow and dresses in buckskin and short shorts, and that's basically all there is to her. And then Bane. I want to talk about Bane for a second. Bane is one of the most prominent Hispanic characters, and yes, he is Hispanic. Now, those of you who saw The Dark Knight Rises, which I'm assuming is probably most of you, so I, I saw The Dark Knight Rises. Okay. He's not Tom Hardy. He, is, uh, you know, he doesn't walk around talking like this. As much fun as that would be. Bane was a guy who was born in a South American prison. Uh, uh, he is Hispanic by nature, um, by, you know, because his mother was and all that sort of thing. Um, and what's interesting about him is how do they choose to represent that part of his identity? Well, they give him a Mexican wrestling mask. He wears a luchador mask. 
and he, and he basically dresses like a professional wrestler. So you can kind of see, and these are enduring characters. These are popular characters. People love Bane. And, but these still come from this sort of very kind of stereotypical place of how do we identify this character as being of this ethnicity, of being this identity? Let's give them the most stereotypical things possible. Now, I want to talk about a very special case. This one's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, in, 20, in 2011, there was, an, uh, there was an event in which Marvel Comics introduced a new Ultimate Spider-Man. Now, for those of you who don't speak nerd, let me explain. There are two main universes in the Marvel Universe. There is the normal, or 616 universe, which is the one that, uh, you know, is kind of the one that's been around for decades. Uh, it's pretty much sort of the standard Marvel mythology. There's also the Ultimate Universe introduced in the late 90s, early 2000s as a way to kind of get rid of years of continuity and take these core concepts, take these characters, and reintroduce them to a younger audience and tell stories in new ways. The problem is they started telling the stories in the exact same ways they had done before. So in 2011, uh, the, the writer of Ultimate Spider-Man, Brian Bendis, decided, looked at some of the things that were going on. You had Donald Glover, the actor, rapper, comedian, uh, who I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with, decided he, want, you know, he was a big Spider-Man fan. He started you know, talking up, like, I would love to be Spider-Man. There was so this huge internet swell of support, petitions trying to get him to be Spider-Man, um, and ultimately it didn't happen. They cast Andrew Garfield in the Spider-Man remake instead, but Bendis looked at that. It's like, you know, it is time that we have a Spider-Man who's not white. It is time that we have a character who is not white. So we introduce Miles Morales, who is uh, half black and half Hispanic. Um, and this is a pretty big news story. It, uh, it makes the front page of USA Today. It's all over the place. It's a big deal. Well, fans weren't happy. I am wholeheartedly against the decision to replace Ultimate Peter Parker with an African-American slash Hispanic person. I am extremely disappointed and offended that you killed off one of your greatest characters of all time for the sole reason of diversity. It not only pushes many readers away, but it is a complete insult to the character Ultimate Peter Parker himself. The character who had been around for about 10 years at that point. That was really hard to be for, it's really hard to believe that people were that attached to. Um, Sp replacing Spider-Man makes about as much sense as replacing Superman. Too iconic of a character. Again, it's 10 years old. And it can't be done. I have nothing against the character in his own right, but IMHO, you should have given him his own costume, his own name, his own story, and not stolen Peter Parker's identity to give him one. So right there, I want you to hold on to that for a second. Because this is one of the things that an actual writer or reader wrote in about. This is from the number one, uh, Spider Ultimate Spider-Man number one. You may have a new Spider-Man, but he'll never be able to be Peter Parker. You didn't just betray the fans, but you betrayed your own character. So what do we see from this? Well, it brings up another one of the themes I want to talk about. There's a clear dichotomy between what is considered to be classic and desirable and correct and what these fans saw as being an interloper. This non-white character, who is, again, replacing a character who hadn't been around that long is seen as this vile, uh, undesirable interloper who is ruining this classic character. It's a, very, it's a tone that's very, very similar to rhetoric we see leveled against uh, people of color every day, especially when it comes to immigration. When, it, when somebody who comes in from a different place or has a different skin tone or a different experience comes in, the white majority oftentimes feels threatened or they feel that something is being taken away from them. And we see that in the realm of superheroes as well. This realm that is meant to be escapist ultimately ends up reflecting some of our more negative characteristics as well. Now, I want to talk about, uh, that when I talked about uh, Ryan Choi for a second, I want to give you a quick picture of what it's like uh, for Asian superheroes, because I did some research on this after that. And what I did is I analyzed the top five best-selling comic books from July to September of 2010, um, because those are the most recent at the time. So I went through all of these 180-plus characters in them, looked through all of them, checked it against the uh, databases, because those databases about what character is who and who does what are some of the most exhaustive uh, things I've ever read. So I'm like, I think I could probably get the right answer from there. So out of all of those characters, only seven of them were definitively Asian. They were actually be able to identify it as Asian. And of them, only two played a lead role in the story. If they were there, they were generally playing some sort of supporting role. They didn't have superpowers, which are usually con con uh, conflated with agency in superhero comics. They were things like, you're a waitress who is being protected by Green Lantern, or something like that. So there was very, very little of that, and they kind of fade into the background. And what Asian heroes we do have are generally stereotyped, and I kind of showed you some examples of that, but all of the classic stereotypes, the, the dangerous and overly sexual dragon lady, uh, the mysterious and scary yellow peril, 
the martial artist. That's Shang-Chi, the master of kung fu up here, okay? They all have a place in superhero comics. Now, I want to talk very briefly about a film. I'm trying to kind of figure out, I'm, I want to do a research project with this. I'm not sure where I'm going with it. How many of you saw The Wolverine this summer? I would think, I would say it's probably, it was one of the better superhero movies that's come out recently. Um, what's interesting about that is that it has only really one white character in it for most of its running time, and that's Hugh Jackman, the lead, and it's Wolverine. The rest of the cast is generally played by uh, Japanese and Asian actors. Um, and what's interesting is that you could argue that it challenges Asian stereotypes, but in reality what it does is it kind of just takes those stereotypes and assigns them to different people. So the sexually dangerous dragon lady is not a Japanese woman, but rather she is the, uh, the main villainess of the movie, the white blonde viper. So I'm trying to figure out what to do with that, and it's kind of an interesting question. When we have a discussion, maybe we can talk about that stuff, but I'm wondering, you know, is simply reassigning or minimizing or subverting those things, are we still dealing in stereotypes? Um, another story that's kind of interesting is how uh, uh, Muslims and uh, Middle Eastern characters are starting to become increasingly prevalent in comics. Uh, we had uh, Night Runner, who was a character introduced in uh, the Batman comics, uh, who was a French parkour artist and uh, part of Batman's kind of global crime fighting team. Uh, we have the 99, which is a team developed by a Muslim scholar uh, to kind of ch uh, combat and challenge stereotypical visions of people in, from the Middle East and of Muslim faith. But very few of these characters are really major, and there are very few of them are really enduring. And we see a lot of resistance, and it's often justified in the minds of uh, the fans by saying, well, I like my characters a certain way. I don't like this new character. I think they're just trying to be overly diverse. They're just trying, it's political correctness. Um, a lot of it's politics. You know, there's still a lot of backlash against people of the Muslim faith and Middle Eastern folks. Um, and there was a crossover between the 99 and the Justice League that DC Comics was very, very excited about, but basically got torn apart by a lot of, by a lot of so called fans, but more often than not, people just political axe to grind. Um, because how dare you cross over American heroes like Superman with people from the Islamic faith? So we have this, uh, we have this sort of trend of uh, reluctance and resistance to this sort of thing. But then recently, we introduced the new Miss Marvel. And just, this is just a couple weeks ago. Marvel Comics uh, editor, uh, Sana Amanat, I probably just butchered her name, and I apologize to her, even though she'll never see this, um, unless she does, in which case I really apologize. Um, she is a Pakistani-American woman, and she was sitting down with one of the editors at Marvel Comics and told some stories about her youth, and like, we have a great idea for a superhero here. So they decided to create Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan. First time a Muslim character has headlined a Marvel comic. Not the first Muslim character in Marvel comics, but the first time we've actually had one in the lead. Um, and the idea behind this was the desire to explore the Muslim-American diaspora. Um, if you're not familiar with diaspora, it's basically kind of like you know, all, people from different cultures coming and sort of uh, uh, go, spreading out and having different experiences and changing culturally and that sort of thing from an authentic perspective. So it's written by a Muslim woman and edited by a Muslim woman. Generally very positive reaction. Some of the fringe groups still have some negative reaction to it. But what's interesting about this comic is it really addresses intersectionality. It specifically talks about how a young Pakistani-American woman would have a different experience than a young Pakistani-American male by specifically talking about Kamala's experience versus the experience of her brother. She feels that she is very kind of controlled. She doesn't really have a lot of freedom, whereas her brother kind of gets to do whatever he wants. And so I want to call attention to a couple things because one of the other things this comic does is it really addresses her conscious of identity. She's an American teenager, but she has to kind of balance wanting to be an American teenager and what that represents, which is usually set by a white majority, with, be, with her faith. So she talks about, like, you know, my chances of becoming an intergalactic superhero are even slimmer than my chances of becoming blonde and popular. So, that, so it's not just the superhero thing that she finds ridiculous. It's the notion that she could ever be popular, which she equates with being blonde and white. Um, she'll, you know, she can never be one of them, no matter how hard I try, I'll always be poor Kamala with the weird food rules and the crazy family. And then when she finally gets her powers at the end of the first comic, she adopts the look of the white uh, Miss Marvel. So she's got blonde hair and all that, and now she's not sure what she'd do with it. So the first thing she asks is, is it too late to change my mind? So her powers are built around this sort of metamorphosis. She can change her shape and uh, kind of change what she looks like. And that is kind of an interesting thing in terms of, you know, how can, you know, it, it takes that sort of notion of balancing identity to sort of the next level. So how far do we have to go to really kind of change to fit what we would kind of consider to be the dominant perspective?
A lot of interesting stuff in that comic, and I really recommend it. I, this is one of the few comics where I read it, and I'm like, I love this comic, and I will read it forever. So I definitely recommend it. So what do we take away from this? Uh, well, white privilege is very much a significant part of superhero comics, and white fans and creators exert that privilege in both conscious and unconscious forms, both by talking about it, by kind of preferring characters that look like them, that sort of thing, and challenging the notion that you might introduce characters who don't look like them. Um, any challenges to the status quo are often mitigated or criticized because fans, you know, the, we, we, well, we got all this backlash, our fans don't like it, so we better, not, we better change it, we better get rid of this. Or worse, they're eliminated because someone in editorial decided, I don't want to write this character anymore. I, don't, I think we want to bring back the classic Green Lantern. We want to bring back this classic character. We can't have room for this other character anymore. So these are problems, okay? But things are changing. They're getting better. And a lot of that is being pushed along by the fact that comics are, that superheroes are no longer just the domain of comics anymore. So we have the new Fantastic Four movie, casting Michael B. Jordan, a black actor, as the Human Torch. And not only that, his sister is being played by Kate Mara, a white woman. So not only do we have the, uh, uh, minor, a character of color being introduced, we also have the notion of a mixed family being portrayed as a normal and probably desirable thing, which is a huge step forward. Uh, we also have more superheroes of color appearing in the media. Luke Cage will be getting his own show on Netflix, which I'm kind of excited for. Uh, we have the Falcon playing a major role in the upcoming Captain America movie. And those of you who saw the film know how important the, uh, the Falcon is to uh, comics history. And we're also seeing this sort of, uh, these movies challenge themselves more. And that's why I want to talk about the Mandarin. Now, again, if you haven't seen the movie, I'm going to ruin it for you right here. This, have you not seen the movie? I have not. Okay. So basically, we have Ben Kingsley, uh, uh, who is uh, both white and Indian, playing this character who is uh, you know, supposed to be this sort of uh, warlord, this terrorist and all that. And, he's cr and he shows up in these sort of like uh, vaguely kind of uh, Middle Eastern kind of Muslim videos and there's Asian imagery and all that. So we're kind of taking all these things we're scared of uh, or that the sort of the kind of white, uh, stereotypical white American establishment is scared of and we're putting them together in one character. But what happens? What do you find out in the movie? He's an actor playing a part. The Mandarin doesn't exist. He's a front for an industrialist who's trying to basically create weapons for the government. It's a brilliant twist, and it talks about not only how we create these sort of boogeymen out of these kind of stereotypes, but also how these boogeymen are created to kind of trick us, to sort of make us not focus on the right things. Another paper I'd love to write at some point. But we're also, seeing a care, we're also seeing companies taking a very strong step towards diversity. And it's very Marvel heavy. I'm sorry for the DC fans out there, but Marvel's really been out in front of this. So we, as they're relaunching the Ultimate Universe, guess who's at the center of it? It's Miles Morales. Not only is he one of the main, uh, not only is he headlining his own book, he's also headlining the new version of the Ultimates, which is the ultimate version of the Avengers. I know, not the most creative name. Uh, we have X-Men number one came out last year. Not only is it an all-female team, but we also have women of color, especially Storm here in the lead. We have Jubilee. We have X-23. These are women who are not traditionally, uh, who do not fit the traditional white stereotype. We have more minority creators becoming more powerful. Greg Pak. Um, an Asian-American creator, is now writing Superman and Batman for DC Comics. I believe he's the first person to do it. It's an amazing step forward. And more and more, we're seeing more channels, the internet, digital distribution, independent publishers like Image and Boom and Dynamite that are offering these opportunities for minority creators and creators to tell stories from a different perspective. So gradually things are changing. But it takes a lot to kind of get these characters that have been around for 70 plus years and kind of kick them into a more diverse uh, and more uh, kind of progressive future. But I think we're getting there. And that's why it's so important to be not only critically reflexive of the media, but also be kind of uh, recognized when it's doing things and making progress. So I want to do that as well. So that's basically it. I'd like to take a few minutes uh, for you guys to ask any questions, discuss some things. Uh, I've talked enough, but I'll talk so if you want me to. Uh, so please, uh, by all means, if you have any questions or want to discuss anything, I feel free. Yes? Do you remember the first comic book you ever read? The first comic book I ever read? 
probably, I don't remember what issue it was, but it was an, ep it was an issue of Spider-Man where he gets shrunk down to Ant-Man size, and he's like riding on flies and stuff like that, and really bad things are happening. And there's also this really sad story about the Sandman, the supervillain, living in this flop house and like trying to deal with this like family that's like the family that owns it is like really mean and abusive to their kids and all that. And he's like trying to, you know, it's, it's, it was really heartbreaking. I was just a little, I was like four years old reading this comic. And I'm just like, wow, this is dark. Like, I, um, like I, I knew the characters, but I didn't know that, that, that they told stories like that. But I still have that somewhere, actually. I think it was my uncle's comic, and he just gave it to me. So I was pretty excited about that. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if I'm assuming this uh, so right. It looks like most of the research you've been doing focuses on data or, 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 or movies and comics made in the United States. Yes. Mm -hmm. Various things. If you go to a place like India, which has its own filmmaking, mm -hmm. do you see the same tendencies when you go to different countries? Um, having, do they have the same kinds of tendencies that you're finding in American-based uh, media production? It's that's a hard question for me to answer because I haven't really done a lot of research uh, outside of America. Um, but uh, my guess would be that a lot of the stereotypes, a lot of things we see, are kind of uh, perpetuated by sort of the by a, a culture that sort of has uh, whites as the majority. So India may have their own stereotypes, their own customs, especially considering you know there's a, there's a class based system and that sort of thing. Um, but would we see the same stereotypes? Not necessarily. Well, I wasn't saying the same stereotypes. Sure. Oh yeah, certainly. Yeah, uh, you see, you 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 do see stuff like that um, in other cultures. Um, I can't speak uh, on an expert level, but I know certainly if you watch uh, films from other countries and that sort of thing, they have their own kind of stereotypes and they have their own sort of things that they will talk about and uh, that sort of thing. So yeah, stereotyping is not necessarily exclusively the domain of American uh, filmmakers and that sort of thing. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's definitely a thing that's it's just sort of universal in a lot of ways and. Uh, we can kind of, there's psychological reasons for that, but. Is there anything unique about our stereotypes? I think uh, a lot of it comes down to power. Um, and a lot of the stereotypes we have and a lot of that are built out of these sort of like systems of inequity and power that have existed for hundreds of years. And a lot of it uh, comes from the fact that we have had uh, whites as the majority, and that's where a lot of white privilege comes from. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's one of those things that's really kind of hard to talk about in the sort of very narrow time frame we have here. But I think that, you know, the experience we have in America uh, very much informs the kind of stereotypes we have and the sort of things we see. Um, and that a lot of it's just, a lot of it comes from history, honestly. Yeah. Uh, just based on your research, uh, where do you think uh, we can see the future of this going as far as comics and stuff? Are we getting more? I would say uh, you, the question is: Are we becoming more or less diverse in terms of we move forward uh, with this uh, with comics and movies? Uh, my guess would be it's going to be more diverse, um, and a lot of that is going to be driven by the profit motive because the people buying tickets to see the movies or buying comics are becoming more diverse as well. It's not the same audience it used to be, um, and there's going to be a sort of push at the editorial level. Um, even if it's only on sort of a basic kind of, uh, and I hope we don't just get into like tokenism where it's just like, okay, uh, well, here's a Hispanic character because we know there's, there's a huge Hispanic audience. I, I, I hope that they're bringing characters in who are interesting and vibrant and who use uh, their backgrounds to tell stories that couldn't be told otherwise. Um, but uh, I think that there will be sort of a push to see more of that stuff, especially um, as we see more uh, minority creators uh, kind of taking over. So that's my hope anyway. Um, it, could all, you know, it could all go south, but we're seeing some very strong things, and uh, definitely the early sales on stuff like Miss Marvel and all that would uh, bear out that people are interested in seeing those kind of more diverse characters and diverse storylines. So I, I would say that we're kind of headed in that direction. Um, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, the question is, why do I think DC hasn't become more progressive? Um, in fairness to them, and uh, part of it's because I'm more of a Marvel guy anyway, um, but uh, 
I, I don't I didn't cover them as much, but they have done some things to try to be a little bit more progressive and inclusive. But you'll also notice they were the ones who kind of did a lot of the regressive things, but killing off minority characters and that sort of thing. Um, and to be to their credit, they did introduce a uh, a Muslim American Middle Eastern Green Lantern. The only problem is that <laughs> he carries a gun. And it's like, you're a Green Lantern. Why do you need a gun? You can literally think anything you want, and it shows up. But because, uh, and for whatever reason, they decided that this Middle Eastern character needed to carry a gun. And I'm not, you know, that's, that is problematic on a completely different level. So, yes, they're making some steps forward, but I think a lot of it comes from the fact that DC is kind of, you know, they have Superman, Batman, they have the characters. Like and there's, those characters are very sort of firmly entrenched. And it really comes down to kind of a different ethos. Marvel, from the beginning, was very much aimed at trying to reflect the real world. So you had these characters who, you know, Tony Stark dealt with alcoholism. You had, you know, Spider-Man couldn't pay his rent. You know, you had characters who were facing these real sort of things. Um, you know, our minority characters are being um, uh, discriminated against. And they were kind of built from that from the beginning. They had the heroes with the feet of clay and all that. Um, DC was always like, these are our characters, they are paragons, they are icons, they don't have that much depth compared to the Marvel characters, but you know, they're enduring. Like Superman and Batman are the most popular characters in the world, pretty much, as far as superheroes go. So that is something I think, and I think you're starting to see it kind of shift because they were sort of sticking to their guns for a lot of the time Marvel was running, but as soon as the sales started picking it from Marvel, they kind of tried to introduce some of that stuff. Um, so I think that there is just sort of that thing where it's just institutionalized, where they haven't quite gotten as far along. But I think, again, I don't want to completely sell them short because they have tried to make some very significant efforts. Uh, the new Blue Beetle is uh, Jamie Reyes, uh, or, uh, and he is a, a, a boy of Hispanic uh, descent. So that's very, very exciting. But of course, he wears a mask. You couldn't tell. So you know, it's kind of one step forward, two steps back. Mm -hmm. but do, are you, do you think that there's going to be, in the comics, like stereotypical things that people of color do? So like, even though that they're going to be in the forefront, mm -hmm. are they, is it just going to show more stereotypes and more stereotypes? So, so the question you're asking then, let me make sure I, 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 I got this. So your question you're basically asking is, if we move characters to the forefront of characters of color, you know, will, we still, will they still just carry the same stereotypes, even though they're in, they're in the lead? Is right. that what you're asking? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question you're asking. Like, um, the question uh, she's asking is basically, are we going to see these characters who are brought to the front? Are they going to be treated like normal characters? Are they going to be treated like stereotypical characters? And the answer is, it kind of depends. Um, I know that's not a real definitive answer, but a lot of this. I mean, we're working in a creative medium like this, even one that's kind of like you know uh, dictated by uh, economics and that sort of thing. It's still a lot of it's up to the writers, the editors, the filmmakers, that sort of thing, and how they want to portray the characters. I do think that when we've seen characters get pushed to the forefront, especially recently, they you know they may carry some things with them that are kind of unique to that experience. But is it necessarily stereotypical? Again, it depends on the writer and the character. Um, I, I want to say that most of the stuff we've seen recently has tried to be, you know, put the characters first and, you know, tell the stories you can with them uh, being of that ethnicity or that faith or that background. Um, but it doesn't have to be stereotypical. I think Miss Marvel does a great job of that. Where, you know, you, obviously there are certain things you have to address with her being a young Muslim American woman in America. But she's also a character. Like, what I love about that character is that um, for all of her, you know, uh, kind of, you know, diversity and uh, progression and all that, she's also, they write her as a dork. She writes Avengers fan fiction where they save uh, the, you know, they save the unicorn kingdom and stuff like that because she's a 16-year-old fangirl. It's fantastic. I mean, and that's the kind of thing where it's just showing that the, these characteristics are things that everybody has regardless of their skin color or something like that. And I think that's what's really kind of neat about what we're seeing, uh, how they write characters now. But it's easy to do that with newer characters, but these characters have been around for you know, 40, 50 years, you have all this baggage, it can be harder. Yeah? Do you think there will ever be a Wonder Woman movie? Do I think there will ever be a Wonder Woman movie? Well, here's the thing. Um, there will be a Wonder Woman in a movie. How about that? Um, the, the upcoming Batman Superman movie is kind of a backdoor Justice League movie, so they're trying to bring in, and I didn't mention this in the presentation, I probably should have, um, but to their credit, they're actually going to make Jon Stewart the Green Lantern. He's going to be played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Now, that's pretty cool. Um, but uh, 
what's interesting, though, uh, is that Wonder Woman will be in there, too. But based, there are some rumors and some speculation that they're not going to go with her actual origin story, which is, you know, she's from, you know, she's an uh, Amazonian princess from an island and all that stuff. And she's, you know, uh, in the comics now, she's the, she's the daughter of Zeus and all that. They're going to make her basically one of Superman's race that crash landed on Earth before he did. So he's, she's not as strong as he is. So basically, the speculation is that if they bring in Wonder Woman, they're gonna, that's how they're going to explain her. So the notion, and I hope they don't do this, I hope this is, whoever came up with this is just completely talking nonsense, but the idea that, that Wonder Woman is basically an inferior version of Superman is incredibly problematic. So I hope that's not the Wonder Woman we get, but it's more likely we get that than we get a Wonder Woman movie on her own. And Marvel has the same problem. I mean, I've talked a lot about DC, but Marvel also has all these great female characters and can't be bothered to make them have their own movie either. So, to answer your question, I don't know. Yes? Um, it's predominantly white. Um, Marvel has been kind of trying to change that, and DC has been trying to change that as well. Greg Pak has written for both. Um, you have uh, more female writers now than you used to, more female artists than you used to, because it used to be kind of an old boys club that's changing. Um, I don't have an idea of the actual demographic breakdown, but like I said, I think to have a uh, you know Pakistani American woman uh, editing Miss Marvel and a Muslim uh, American woman writing Miss Marvel, that's a pretty significant step forward. Um, and you see, uh, you know, like you have Greg Pak writing. Superman and Batman. That's a pretty big step forward. So in terms of the numbers, I don't know, but we are seeing more minority and female creators working on bigger projects, and I think that's really cool. Yes? Do you think uh, a lot of the independent comics, comics produced just to help kind of look at the source of those things, that there's more diverse background? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the question is, do you think that uh, the, uh, the independent comics and creators have tried to push it along uh, towards more progressive uh, and inclusive things? Yes, absolutely. Um, and we see this all the time in any media, the independent creators, the people who are not beholden to uh, a, you know, court, you know, trying to make huge profits or something like that, but create something that people like, that people latch on to. Um, they oftentimes push the mainstream into doing something that they were doing. And we see that with video games, we see that with movies, we see that with music, all that stuff, okay? So comics, yes, I think that is absolutely the case because you can kind of, and a lot of it is if you're an independent creator, you create a comic from a particular perspective, you might get hired by Marvel or DC to, to, to write something. You know, they're kind of like a farming uh, ground for new talent. So that's kind of, that's one way they can kind of influence it. Um, but again, uh, a lot of it is just breaking down those barriers and access um, and creating the access and the platform that independent stuff can create, I think will help with that a lot. I think we have time for one more. Any more? Okay, well, thank you all so much for coming out. I know it's freezing cold out there, so I appreciate you making the trip. Um, I loved uh, talking to you guys, and uh, hopefully I'll get to do it again sometime. So thank you very much. Thank you.